the General and the Angel. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. Now, this entry includes two previous stories that I am told are some of my best, but then a last installment to continue the tale. It has been requested, so I thought we would add these two to our ongoing tale segment of the channel, if there is the appetite for this, of course. So, if you enjoy the video and want more of the same, then do like and subscribe and consider sharing the video a tad. To jump to the new story, then just hit the timestamps in the description to the video. But I hope you will enjoy this for what it is. So, welcome to the General and the Angel. The old general looked out at his staff and sneered. It had been a complete success, a total victory. The enemy had been driven before them, then utterly annihilated. The Xenos threat was ended, and his men cheered and drank themselves into stupefaction. But all he could concentrate on was the cost. He knew there should be joy, must be celebration. It was required to keep the spirits of the men high, and they had earned it. But he could not enjoy a single moment, not one, for he would never see his friend again, because they had fallen, all of them. Their drop pod strikes, their fleet engagements, they had bought the time he needed to muster the forces of the guard, the Astra Militarum under his command, had smashed the enemy before he even set sail toward them, so that which came on at his ships of the line, the forces on the planets they had infested, they were mere dregs. The heart of the war had been ripped from it before his men even assembled, let alone took the field against them. But in doing so, they had been wiped out. He rose, waving away his attendants with a curt nod and an explanation of fatigue. He left the bawdy ballroom. He went to remember and to mourn. General Mastener usually strode everywhere. His shoulders back, his head high, the air of command that surrounded him, not generated by the stars or medals or rank insignia, but by his countenance, his very being. But not tonight. As he left the light and laughter and loud music of a celebration of victory, a pageant to life, his pose shifted. The shoulders slumped, the head dropped, and his eyes, ever forward, ever on his course, now surveyed the long corridor to his destination, the most secluded spot on the entire station, his most favorite place in the galaxy. For it was quiet, an island of calm and tranquility in an existence of constant buffeting crowds and, and questioning faces, orders, dispatches, meetings and direction. He was a conductor of the orchestra that was the Imperium's war machine, a leader amongst a race forever under assault, perpetually one set of mistakes away from extinction, no matter how powerful humanity may seem. Few knew how their entire civilization balanced precariously on the very nice edge. He did. But not because he was a general, had been for a long year even then. Because so many of the generals and leaders of the forces of mankind were insular, siloed, bunkering in their own microcosmic empires. They did not see the bigger picture. Because the canvas was too huge, too expansive, but General Mastana had come to see that one tiny segment of the tapestry could reveal more than the dizzying panoramic visage of the whole. All because of his unlikely friend, 
the one he came to mourn so bitterly. His slow steps rang out. He had his boots cuffed in metal at their sole and at their tip, just for this effect. He had done so because he was so tired of the scurrying and panic movement people performed when he appeared unexpectedly. So the shoes had metal tip and sole, so he announced his arrival way before its advent. But now, the slow clip of his pace echoing along the corridor did nothing but underline the emptiness. The reason he had loved this spot had become the reason he now hated it. Because it would now be empty. He knew this, but it hurt. He turned the last corner, and just for one second, for one fleeting moment, he closed his eyes as he did so, so he could pretend, so he could avoid the moment for just one second longer. But he could not. He cursed his stupidity, his weakness, as he slowly raised his eyes. And there it was, the small viewport at the end of his journey, but nothing else. He took the paces required to get to the aperture into the void, then just stood there, looking out at the beauty of the nebula, its colors and lights flickering. It was hypnotic in its sublime perfection. The light shone, and he could feel them twinkling off the light now welling up in his eyes. He was alone, for his friend was not there, and never would be again. He cast his mind back to the first time, how he had been so desperately looking for a spot of sanctuary. His first day on the station, his first command. And yet, it had been too much. He had to take an hour to himself before he went to his palatial apartments, the largest on this station. So he had walked and walked, until finally the crowds became occasional passers-by, then on, until none passed him at all. He walked past, then took two paces back, and into this one quiet area. The lights had dazzled him so, that he missed out on the only other thing there. He lurched mesmerized until he was able to place his hand on the viewport, infinity and beauty in his fingers as he looked out on the nebula. His reverie was interrupted when he took fright and leapt a bunny hop back in shock. Someone had been standing there too, a goliath in warplate, a statue of perfection. And he looked at the figure that stood beside him so tranquilly. He was a gargantuan, easily over eight foot in his mammoth armor. Yet his face, his visage, it was calm, his features so pure, his gaze so intent and yet so open. The being was an Astartes, a space marine. From his near perfect makeup, his long blonde hair, he could be nothing but a son of the angel. Maslana's gaze elicited movement, and it was as if that statue suddenly came to life. He moved slowly, carefully, calmly, turning his head to look down to Mastina. Looking back, General Mastina knew that the angel had moved this way to prevent him from running. For he had seen them in combat, and their merest gesture could terrify and shatter the mind for a moment, could form a rout. For something so large, so powerful, so strong, to move with such alacrity, such precision, it bent the normal laws of reality that the human mind could accept without recoiling. This was a kindness unto itself. As their eyes met, the deep blue of the Astartes was rich and almost kind, his pristine and expressionless face a lie for within those eyes the pain and struggle of hundreds of years were dancing. Yet also contained within was the passion of a father defending his child, all framed by the ivory perfection of a noble face. He just nodded down at Mastina, before returning to his basking in the beauty of the galaxy. The general did the same, and they both enjoyed the silence together. Not one word was said. 
Finally, Mastina had turned and saluted the Marine, his legs so tired from the transit, and then being on them without break for twenty-four hours in this, his first day. He did not want to break the moment, but could not elongate it any longer. He had to rest before the havoc of the day to come. To his surprise, the Marine just nodded his head and half-smiled, seemingly unable to break his concentration on the viewport. And so, the pattern was set. A pattern that lasted over a hundred years. For his station was the main stopping off point in the sector. From here, General Mastina organized Astra Militarum to meet the threats. And it was here that the blood spears had to dock as they went from one end of the sector to the other, always moving, always fighting. And whenever the Astartes fleet docked for any reason, Mastina would look to his control panels to see if anyone was there, in that place, that sacred spot. And he always was, standing alone, a moment of respite in a world of war and death and pain. Mastina would conclude the business of the day and always, always, take the time to go to simply stand with the Marine. The Blood Spears chapter was guarding this region of space, so they passed the central stack very often. It took a decade of this until finally it began. Words. Beautiful, isn't it? The perfect angel said. With such passion it shocked Mastina. That was all. And when Mastina never bothered the Marine, never questioned, never said a word, it slowly developed. After a decade more of limited lines, small statements, Mastina answered back, but only briefly at first. While well, they both basked in the glory of light and colour, of a moment of rest in a world of war, a kinship, a bond, was formed. And by the end of it, after more than eight decades, and a painful reju for Mastina, it was a ritual neither would miss. For the angel now spoke to Mastina, telling him of the actions he had fought, where he was going, what they had done. And Mastina would not console, would not praise or simper. He merely listened, calmly, with compassion, but without pity. The list was never ending, no respite ever for his friend. He even brooked this once, the only time he ever did. We move on to Phi Canter Alpha to meet elements of the Navy, the 285th Flotilla. We will be clearing out the Corsair's base your men so ably pinpointed. Then on to Boris 12 to confront the Mirna, Xenos incursions from the nebula are ramping up, old friend. Then, if the Emperor guides our bolters and our warp routes, we will be returning to head to Apollon Secundus for the campaign against the war. A hard decade, this one. With the rift, things are worse, said Mastina. I must ask, in all of the time I have known you, we have never discussed your respite, your core. How can even you go from war to war without breaking, without rest? What do you do to stay sane? The angel looked at him, almost in shock, and he slowly swept out his hand at the vista they both viewed. I have this. That was all he said. These few hours snatched in months of endless engagements, seconds only really. Mastina did not know. How could he? He felt ashamed that he had interrupted the angel's only quiet moments. And for two visits, he let him be. Until on the third visit, a communication came to the deck. The first and only time he ever sent a message. It said simply, Your presence is missed. And so Mastina returned to his visuals with him. He felt so honored. He took notes, many records, and made them a document, a testimony. He had always written them up in rough and put in the details of locations and battles when they are long past, when there was no strategic import anymore. 
and the annals, as Mastino called them, grew. Until that final day. The largest war ever seen in this region had erupted out of nowhere. Rocks slammed into worlds across the sector, and the worst of it was that they made a path straight for the core station. But before that, the pathway took them on a straight line to the chapter planet of the Blood Spears. The regiments were bogged down in long engagements or on furlough. Standing preparedness had been ground down under the constant conflicts since the warp tear across the galaxy. And the Blood Spears were few, less than half of a chapter's strength. So many times had command advised that the chapter be permitted to reprovision and to be given a short reprieve to recruit. But they had always refused. Always. The battle barge docked, its small fleet of strike cruisers and supports. All that remained of the chapter's strength that was not already at their home world, preparing for the battle to come. And the angel was there, standing, but he seemed tense when Mastina arrived. By just the tiniest shuffles, the minutest sway, he gave away his disquiet. And then he spoke again, but faster than usual, with good pace, clear, but with a tinge of desperation. He had much to tell. And so they stood, and he told Mastina. He told him his name. He told him how he had become an angel, how he had trained, how he had learnt, how he had developed. He told Mastina of all the things he did not know. Nothing a mortal man should not know, of course. But as much as he could tell him, he did. And Mastina knew when he finished. He knew he had told him all of these things because... Mastina saluted him as always, but his finest, sharpest salute. And for the first time ever, the angel turned to him fully and slowly gave the sign of the Aquila and bowed. Mastina left him for the first time ever. Instead of going to his apartments, he went back to the command. He worked and worked until his eyes swam, his vision blurred. It was days before he was forced to rest. He took six hours sleep, then returned. He would push his men, would send messages and orders, would smooth every holdup, remove any of the tiny glitches that slowed a muster by calling even subalterns personally. There would be no delays. He sent out commissars with orders to execute any who caused any form of holdup. He would get the men ready. For the blood spears were facing the full fury of the war and they could not do it alone. Not at only 40% of their strength. If anyone could do it, if anyone could hold out long enough, it would be them. So Mastina worked harder than he had since he was 20. He was tireless. For once, just this once, he wanted to return the favor. For it to be the forces of his Astra Militarum who came in and saved the day. Not for ego or honor, but because they owed the Blood Spears. So much did they owe them. The Navy finally mustered, his men finally aboard. He took command himself and led them to the path of the war. But they were too late. Damn them. They were not in time. The orcs they met on their way were pitiful mobs of rabble. Their vessels were battered and smashed and far, far fewer than reports may believe. And so the Navy swept them before them. But then they found out why. He had known, of course, but most had not. They arrived at the chapter planet of the Blood Spears. When they translated into real space, the system was cluttered with debris. Millions of tons of scrap blasted apart and floating like minefields in their path. So much carnage had the Blood Spears' own ships meted out to the orcs. The scans showed them all they needed to know. They sent down Mechanicus and Militarum forces. They checked over the still-burning wreck of that place, that fortress. 
The orcs had destroyed everything. They had killed near all of the marines, beaten them down, smashed their bodies to pulp when they fell. Only one pair of survivors were said to be interned into dreadnoughts. So the blood spears were gone. The orcs had even taken their gene seed and used it for a bonfire, throwing it at walls to see if it would stick, fit it to their horrifying little ball monsters. The blood spears were gone for all time. And so, Mastina hunted down and exterminated the last remains of the Xenos. But it would never bring them back. It was revenge only. And when he returned to his post, his headquarters amongst the stars, he wrote his report. He knew nobody would ever take it seriously. It would avail him naught. But he had to write it. He had to send it. He had to make his case for a founding. A mere general in an outlying border. He knew he was wasting his time. But it was all he had to spare now. Time. For he never went back to that viewport again. The time he would have spent there, he spent on the annals. To make them perfect. So he could pass them on. Times had been hard, and the Reaper now wished his toll. It had been many decades now. We had been cut off from the outside, and communication was almost pointless. We never gained a response we could trust. Astropathic choirs had been almost pointless, and were a massive risk to use. I had tried, had done my duty. Another Eju, then another. I was not meant to live this long, I think. Saw General Mestina. And it was the end. After such a long time. The endless attacks. Corsairs, greenskins, the silvered legions of the dead. The predations of a myriad of small pocket Xenos powers that had grown up in our weakness. And we were on the last throw of the dice. As the latest war came plowing out of the void towards my station. I knew it was over, but we would fight anyway. With near 40% of our previous realm chewed away, we lost resources and manpower. The last assault had been the worst for decades. For without that one chapter of Space Marines, that one force of a mere thousand super soldiers, we were lost. They say the Guard fights the wars, the Marines win the battles. But without the Marines to win some of those hardest of all battles, we, the Militarum, had lost. Slowly at first, then the dam had broken. We faced certain destruction at the hands of these scum, that's what I thought. Yet when they were closing, eating up the thousands of miles between us, the impossible happened. A miracle. For out of the warp, a fleet translated. Battle barges, strike cruisers, escorts, and Astartes force. Thank the throne. They had come. And I could not do anything but stare slack-jawed at the screen as the markings came into my vision. It was not possible. They were gone. Then one simple message was beamed from the capital battle barge of three. It read simply, To General Maskina, you fought like a tiger over the years, kept the fires burning, but it's time to order your forces to withdraw and stand down. We have this. I'm sorry it took so long, old friend. And the message read, from the Bloodspears Chapter Master. Mascana looked on as the ships of the Astartes force fell into an oh-so-familiar attack pattern. Their vessels were new, their markings freshly painted, but familiar. 
and the orc force was smashed within an inch of their finishing line. For if they had taken this station, the entire sector would have fallen. Yet the fury of the Astartes was unstoppable, and soon all that remained of the invasion force was a scrap field, one he had not seen since that day he translated over a certain fortress monastery world all those years ago. At the conclusion of the battle, Mastina slumped into his chair for a moment, while his exhausted bridge staff whooped and cheered at their survival, their deliverance. He wiped his face of the sweat there, and then rose. He barked out orders for the next eight hours, as the Astartes fleet broke up and scouted the entire system for stragglers. The lead battle barge came into dock, and it was irrefutable. The sigils the same, the colours the banners, all the same. When all was quiet, when all was done, Mastina went to the only place he could think of, just in case. And as he walked, his feet echoed on the hard deck and corridors again. He did so with purpose, and he was not disappointed. For as he turned that corner toward the viewport, there a marine stood. He had a long cape just off the ground, gold and red in its trim, helm in the crook of his left arm, long blonde hair cascading down his back, like a mantle for his cape. But he stood in the spot. And so, General Mastina slowly paced up to his place and stood, viewing the nebula. And thus, the warrior next to him spoke. Beautiful, isn't it? Mastina slowly turned his head, but found he had to crane it up even more than he remembered. He had not been around marines for so long, had he forgotten their size? The angel broke the silence again. No, you are not mistaken. I am taller now. And he began his tale, always looking out at the nebula. You see, I was found by the Mechanicum, my body broken, barely alive. They interned me in the dreadnought then, when the spears were disbanded. Nothing left to remain for. They placed me in another chapter. I had thought that the end. I fought and was awoken again, slept and awoken again. But in all of that time, something else was afoot. You see, someone had sent a message, a plea to the High Lords of Terra, a request for a founding. It never got there, but it was received by the Indomitus Crusade, something I will explain later. At first, it was ignored along with so many other transmissions. But one Ensign read it. He took it to his data slate and read it for weeks, every line, every paragraph, and he gave it to others, and they gave it to others. And slowly, by slowly, it rose through the ranks. Until finally, a trillion to one chance. A man that is not a man, a leader that is more a god, the son of the Emperor, Reboot Gilliman himself, read it. For all that was going on, it was so compelling, so honest, so true, that is what he told me, that he could not stop reading it. And he took action. He had men of the blood with him in his grey shields, but more than this, he asked one question that nobody else would. Are any of them left, even one. And so it was that I was found. I was brought aboard his ship, and he spoke to me himself, offered me the choice, and I accepted. They took me from my dreadnought, performed a surgery on me that seemed unlikely to work. Only Mark Nayas Kalgar had received this before and lived, but they made me whole again. They made me primaries. And then he, Reboot Gilliman, made me the chapter master, and he gave me all of the men, ships, and support I would need. So the blood spears are back. We are here now. Because of you. Because you wrote that annal of my words. 
because you sent it out when anybody else would have put it on a wall for their own posterity. Because of you. Thank you, Mistina. You have no idea what it was like without you and the spears. We lost so much. The angel now stretched out his much larger arm and simply put his hand on the general's shoulder, did not look at him, continued to look out at the stars, and simply said, Don't worry, Mastina. We are returned. We shall take it all back. And the blood spears will stand with you, your men, your women. We will win the battles you cannot fight. We will endure. We will fight together. In the name of the Emperor. Until the stars themselves burn cold. The Sound of Revenge General Mastina looked out on the field, the place that had been torn to pieces over weeks of fighting, hard fighting. Fighting he and his men had not been winning. They had taken the barrages, men and women evaporated in heat explosions, thrown into the air and scattered over the defences from high-impact rounds. But they had endured. But they had not been able to stop the enemy. Counter-attacks had been pushed back. Outflanking maneuvers and repositioning had bought them time, split the most forceful assaults. But now, finally, they had run out of time. The last push had broken through two rings of defences, and they were now within striking distance of his CNC. The rebels. The scum. Mastina had spat teeth and fire when he had been informed. One of their own. A human world. A world guided by the Emperor's light, long protected by his armies. It was one of the region's most important manufactorums. It provided him with a good tenth of his arms each year. And it had rebelled. Why? Mastina had been livid. After everything they had suffered, everything they had done for these stuck-jawed inner worlds, his men and women had died in their millions, had fought tooth and nail, had always protected everything that could be protected, had taken back near all of the losses of the dark days, when they did not have the support they now had. Yet, these scum claimed tyranny, slavery, that life was not worth living under the Imperium. Popping jays and fops all, their nobility had become rich, fat and lazy. But worse, they had become rebellious, so plumped with their own conceit were they. But none of them had fought. None of them knew the horrors that existed in the darkness of the void. None of them had any idea what life would be like under the Necrons, the Orcs, the Eldar, the Zathin, the Slort. Mustaina knew all too well that he was at fault, sort of. For he had always assumed that the inner worlds, their populations, would know what had been done in their name. How could they not know? But on the voyage here, he had been very introspective. He had not even sent out Picts or Vids. He had not had his glorious men march in victory parades. He had not lauded his own victories. He had assumed that they knew. But how could they? None of the regiments that fought were from their world, so they could not feel the losses. No connection to the troops. They had no knowledge of any of it. He, General Mastina, had treated them like children. He had not only shielded them from the enemy, he had shielded them from the horrible truth of it. The terrifying truth that it only took a few successive errors, a string of defeats, and the entire region would be lost. It almost had, before his friend had returned. And his friend had been so busy. It seemed even more so than before, all those years ago when he was a foot shorter. 
but the two always met, even now. Even with three campaigns of reclamation in full swing, it was the only time Mastina ever took a break, even for a few hours. Usually, his life was to awaken to casualty reports, engagement notes and tallies, then to his day of command, then back to sleep, but not before an entry. Each and every night the general would add to his annals the records that had been so effective in making the impossible happen. He had been performing this ritual for decades, and it was the only thing he ever did for himself. And even then, it was truly for his friend. So when Mastina had heard of the rebellion, he was livid, incandescent. So livid, he made a massive miscalculation. He had thought that his arrival would quell the rebellion immediately. He refused to cancel or denude Strike Force Theta of any of its resources. It was a reclamation formation, and was needed to hit at the eastern fringe to back up the other Strike Forces, take some heat from the southern front, and claim as many worlds for the Imperium again as possible. So when he left to stamp on the throat of every noble in the court, he had taken the reserves and replenishment forces. But they were not veterans. He had thought it would be a fate to complete. So off he went with a small flotilla of naval transports and a few escorts, all filled with his green troops. The arrival was a shock unto itself, for the world had lowered themselves to hiring raiders. They had engaged a small pirate fleet to assist them. Of course, allowing the pirates to use their world as a base, a safe haven. They truly knew no depths of depravity and treachery. And when the Imperial naval ships arrived, it was a coast knife fight straight off the bat. The brigands soon beat a retreat, being used to preying on the weak and defenseless. Even the escort ships of the line were more than their match, but it meant that the Navy would need to stay on high alert, could not descend into the upper atmosphere and bombard the enemy. Mastina and his men would need to win this one on the ground. When the landers came down, a good percentage were knocked out of the air, crashing to the ground and incinerating those thousands of men and women inside. Waste. A damn waste of life, thought Mastina, when he managed to arrange a CNC. And it did not get better from there. For the traitors had been planning this for years, had harbored arms, kept back supplies and armor intended for the front. All the time Mastina and his soldiers had been fighting, these peculating slime had been slowly constricting his reinforcements. They had planned this for decades. So when his men marched from their landers, it was almost instant carnage. His troops had the training, the discipline, the coordination, but the rebels had the advantage of local knowledge, knew every inch of their world, and they had enough armor, weapons, and homegrown troops, as badly trained as they were, to form an entire reclamation expedition of their own. Mastina was enraged. And thus, he made more mistakes. Mistakes he would never have made before. And it was now after being pushed back in an ever-decreasing circle that the enemy had offered parley. They had offered to meet, to discuss surrender. The entire command room had gone silent when the comms officer had read out the message to their lord. Mastina had nodded, then sought. Those seconds were punctuated by the blipping of screens and the clank of metal but not a man or woman there even breathed as they looked at their ancient commander. Finally, General Mastina walked to the Orspex officer and indicated one last scan. And it was then that a single ship came out of the Mandeville point. One. But it was too distant to make out, to even detect its size, let alone its course or loyalty. But Mastina just looked down and slowly took out his pistol. A few closest to him almost rose, holding themselves into their seats with white knuckles. Surely not. Not he, Mastina. He would not do it. His fingers caressed across the gift. 
a bolt pistol from his friend. The highest sign of respect possible, worth more than any medal, any accolade. And his friend had made it himself. With the aid of the tech marines of the chapter, he had wanted to carve every line, sheen every angle. He had done it himself. And all in the room breathed an exhaled sigh when Mastina finally put it back into its holster. He looked at the screen again, the single ship, and he closed his eyes hard, scrunching them in his forehead. Then he snapped his eyes open and looked around the room. And he smiled as he made the sign of the Aquila. All present rose and responded. His arms now swung down to his side as usual. He was always orderly, economic in his movements. Mastina had then chuckled and responded clearly and almost jovially. Yes, we will meet them. Tell them we require a day of grace, a cycle of cessation of combat, before we meet them, as a sign of good faith. The deck was silent. Had their lord finally cracked? Had he given up? None knew. But the signal was silent. And within two hours, the firing had ceased. The enemy did not need to shell men who were about to surrender. And so, the day arrived. Mastina had refused a dozen requests for people to go in his stead. Some rather forcefully. It could be a trap. But the old general waved them all away, or merely deployed his much-vaunted sneer. The one that informed the officer in question that his suggestion was so stupid that he would not even deign to answer it. He stood in his best-dress uniform, and that worried his men a lot. His honor guard was wary and kept between him and the enemy lines during that long trudge for the dawn had shown the enemy were already in place. They had even erected a huge marquee as a venue. Mastina had watched them for an hour, out there on the plain, a gaggle of dandies and fops all congregated around a canopy, and had fine amasek and rare dainty nibbles brought out to them on trays. To them, this was a moment of utter victory, and they wanted to see it all. The nobility had gathered to watch him surrender. But Mastina walked tall, strode to them as if he were the one in the better position. His lines were silent as he took his first steps up the planks and gangways into no man's land. The opposition gave up a cry of exultation as he appeared. The banners of every Astro Militarum regiment there in his procession. It was a spectacle, all right. The nobles giggled and pointed as they thought he was playing along, giving them the respect they were due. When they got closer, one of the nobility, obviously their leader, moved to the highest point of a small hill. The Marquis sat behind it so that all could witness this historic moment. His men decked out in ridiculous sashes and medals and awards. Not one of them had been earned in combat. Mastina wanted to vomit. His honor guard let off a slowly building growl at the effrontery of it all. For they were his men. Despite being considered green only weeks before, they had been blooded and had taken three lives for every one of theirs lost. And Mastina was proud of every last one of them. Proud. His own entourage marched to place, then stamped as they stopped the general walking through an open corridor between his guards. He walked tall as he approached the rise. He ascended it easily, but steadily, and looked into the eyes of the maggot who was standing there. Said enormously corpulent slug had a wide smile on his face as the general marched the last fifty paces to then stop ten paces between them. Mastima wanted all to hear, so he stood at this distance away, so the noble would have to project. But the fool had construed this as a sign of fear, of cowardice. Welcome, welcome General Mastima, legend of the Imperium, said the Ethnarch. 
And who am I addressing? said Mastina. I am Ethnarch Pandemas, the first among equals, the lord of the planet and all who reside on it, all who visit it, including, it seems, you. Pfft, very nice. I am sure that impresses whatever catamites you may have hidden under those rolls of fat. At that, the ethnarch grimaced. It would behoove you to be civil, General. I can only be magnanimous to another of high blood, high breeding. Do not force me to treat you as low-born. At least think of your valiant troops when you address me, for your actions will reflect on them and how they are treated thereafter. Thereafter what, you bloated turd? The ethnarch's face and many of those looking on curled into grimaces at the continued breach of decorum. Some put their hands over the ears of their children, who weren't present. A few even fainted at the crassness on display. Mastina was wrecking their little event, going off script. Well then, let me be as colourful as yourself. I can curse with the best of them. Get on your bloody knees. Get down in the dirt and crawl. Call to me and kiss my ring. As he said this, the ethnarch raised his hand, which had a magnificent jewel attached to it by a wide band of gold, opulence at its finest. Or shall I have my men force you to kiss my other ring? Tittering, chortles and mock-affronted gasps at the colourful discourse were rampant behind the ethnarch. Mastina then looked at his chronometer, slow and steady. He then smiled a wolfish smile at the ethnarch, as he dramatically held his hand over his eyes to shade them, looking into the skies. As he did this, all about them did the same. His guard, the gathered nobility, their forces. And they could make out tiny teardrop-shaped lumps of metal screeching out of the skies, tiny, but getting bigger. Bastina then took down his shading hand, and fixed a steely gaze on the ethnarch. Listen up, fatso. You are a dead man. But if you surrender right now, in this very instance, I will signal my friend to stop his assault. What? How dare you? Your men are beaten. Your troops litter across the lands. A few reinforcements from orbit are not going to save you. Get on your knees. Now, General! Mastino looked down and shook his head slowly, before raising it again. OK, do it the hard way. I'm going to stand here until you surrender. Let's see what happens, shall we? But every minute I stand here will cost your world one more percent of your tithe. Do it for your people, Ethnarch. But do it now. The Ethnarch stood transfixed, puce in face apoplectic with rage, yet unaccustomed to being denied. His jaws flapped, and he huffed and puffed. In a normal situation, he would order his men to slay the affronting party immediately. But he and his guard took one look at Mastina and his men. They had never seen them up close, you see. And the steely gaze of the general now sent shivers down his spine. The look of his guard had barely contained rage, around which was set scarred sinews and rugged determination. No. The ethnarch would not order a shooting match start here while he was in such close proximity to these men. But he was the victor, surely. Why would Mastina not admit this? Why? And then the sound happened. At first, it was a few muffled explosions as these teardrops crashed to the earth but the sound of the impact was as nothing to the thunder that followed. It was as if a hundred storms were going off at the same time, despite the cloudless blue skies. Thunder echoed across the battlefield, across no man's land, but it was coming from the side of the rebel lines, and it was getting closer. The nobility now cowered, but not the Ethnarch himself. He still looked at Mustina as if he were attempting to get him to surrender by sheer will alone. 
But as it got even closer, the sound of the thunder, the Esnark's poise evaporated. What? What is that? The general responded. That? You have never heard that. Holy throne. You think to rebel against the Imperium. Yet you have no idea what it is, what we do, why, how. That you do not even recognize this sound. I've never even heard it. That means I have been too good at my job. I have mollycoddled you all. And this is my reward. Reward? Yes. This moment, right now. You see, I have been waiting for it since our second week of engagement. I underestimated you, all of you. How cowardly you have been to harbour such forces. How selfish to not give them to the war effort. How pathetic that you have never truly read any reports, even as an ethnarch. I have underestimated your weakness, your venal egotism, your hubris. And despite all of my errors, this is my reward. To be here the moment it happens. To look in your eyes as it happens. The ethnarch took a step back and wailed. What? What is that sound? Tell me! I command it! That? That is the echo of terror. That is the sound of retribution. That is the sound of holy Balta fired in wrath. That is the sound of the Emperor's vengeance. That? That is the sound of his angels of death! As the last words were spat from the General's mouth, the eyes of the Ethnarch became the size of saucers. His jaw dropped and his legs shook. And it was also the moment that a fast-moving vehicle came skimming out of the rebel lines. Above them, explosions of fire, screams of the dead and dying, the panicked and the broken, all washed across the plain toward the waiting dignitaries. The vehicle was so fast that it circled the two groups on the small raised area. The nobles all screaming and throwing themselves to the floor, many weeping at being in danger for perhaps the first time in their lives. The Imperial Guard contingent stood prouder, their shoulders back a little further, their chest puffed a little more. They knew exactly who had arrived by his banners. In person. The fast vehicle then skimmed in and hovered above the two men on the hill, and something huge came out of it. The massive bulk landed on the ground, throwing up sod that covered the ethnarch, who was now wailing and slowly folding into himself as he went down onto his knees. The huge being stood tall again, his war plate sparkling in the sun, his long cape barely above the ground, his iron halo cresting his power-armoured head. A chapter master of the Adeptus Astartes, of the Space Marines, a living legend. He reached up and took off his helmet as he took a few paces and stood before his friend, General Mastina. Mastina beamed up at the golden blonde warrior that towered over him. You took your time. <laughs> Many apologies, old friend. A tussle with the slot, tricky fighting, said the huge space marine. This is becoming a bit of a habit. What? You coming in at the last minute to save the day? Excuse me, said the Marine, as he whipped out his bolt pistol and casually shot over his shoulder at the ethnarch. The bolt round flew into his head, penetrating and then exploding. The sound was wet, and even at this distance, flecks of blood and brain matter spattered both Mastina and the Marine. The ethnarch's guards had already fled. The Marine then took one step forward, with lightning fast reflexes. He took the handkerchief that the General had in his sleeve, and they began to wipe Mastina's uniform. All stood aghast as the Marine cleaned the old man, like a doting mother clucking over her child. Sorry about the mess, old friend. As you very well know, saving the day is what I was born to do. And when it comes to you, it isn't just an honor. It isn't just a duty. It is a pleasure. He then stepped back, job done, and raised a salute. 
My men will break all last resistance. We must be swift, old friend. We are both needed on the southern fringe. It's getting dicey out there, and the men need you to stiffen their resolve. Orchestrate them, as you always have. The rebels, they had not seen Baltas in action, nor fought against the space marines. The world gave its unconditional surrender exactly 22.5 minutes after the first Balta was fired. And never, ever, rebelled again. It had only taken five years. In the eyes of the Imperium, this was barely enough time to blink. In Mastina's small corner of the Imperium, things had gone from strength to strength. The southern region had been pacified, the northern consolidated, and the western was now the only battlefront left. And that was more an exercise in patience than raw power. Raiders, but stupid ones, Greenskins. Over the time, now able to go back on the aggress, Mastina's doctrines had worked wonders on the defense, but it turned out his true flair came in the assault. He would restrain his friend where necessary, let him off the leash the moment he could, and the Bloodspears chapter master usually agreed with him, but also gave him the latitude to err, to do the unorthodox to give it a whirl, as Mastina said. When the Marine did not agree, he raised his objections, then loitered around to be ready to reinforce and reconquer if things went sideways. Yet, this was very rare, and never to an extent that they could not even prod each other over the events. The mistakes of that rebel world, the overconfidence, the underestimation of his enemy, when Mastina had nearly been defeated, it had improved the general's judgment. He was now even more clinical, yet no less driven. The only real campaign left would be to head out into the west. The orcs were being pushed in their direction by something. That is all that Mastina knew. Something that could make the greenskins migrate would be no laughing matter at all. Mastina was planning how he could possibly gain the forces for an aggressive campaign but the long hours, the Herculean efforts he had made to hold on, they had taken their toll. All could now tell he was getting closer to the moment. The spirit was more than willing. He was energized from a morale perspective, yet the flesh was weak. And so they sat down one day and discussed it. The Bloodspear chapter master, Damarian Darman, was present not just his persona of the old general's angelic friend. They shot straighter than they ever had before. General Mastina did not enjoy the depth of familiarity the Damarian Daemon had with his vital statistics, but it would be a fool who questioned where an angel of death gained his intelligence, even for Mastina. And so they came to the conclusion that there were only two possible outcomes. Mastina could go into retirement on a high, so he would not let down the fleet and sector command mid-campaign. If Mastina's heart gave out on him in the middle of a battle, it could be catastrophic. The other option was to give it one last shot. Another rejuve. A dangerous option, as he had received so many before. Diminishing returns was often the way when attempting to cheat nature and his last rejuve had not done the wonders of the preceding interventions. A bad sign. But both had known this going into the conversation, so they decided, together, on one last try. Mastina's eyes opened, and he instantly regretted it. Light. It burnt his eyes, hurt his head. He was parched his lips difficult to separate, to speak. A reedy voice came out when he did, more a noise than a proper vocalization. 
Shadow fell over him as a high-ranking physician was instantly at his side. Water. He tasted it, but it was difficult to swallow. He could not raise his arms easily to take the cup. He barely supported it. The shade permitted him to focus his sight, and he looked around. At the door were two of his personal guard, looking stern, one just coming off notifying someone over a vox speed. And then he saw the gaggle of physicians in a cluster at the other end of the hospital ward, a ward only he was in. Skirty. Mustina's heart dropped. The medics all looked fearful, as if deciding who would go to see him. Who would have to give him the bad news? Because he could feel it. He now noticed his breathing was shallow, but fast. The meek physician spoke on for minutes, then one finally was elected. He turned, holding a syringe in his right hand. Slack-shouldered, the man now slowly trudged towards the general. The door slid open, and three giants in red metal armor barely squeezed through the door, one more in white armor following. Two of them stepped sideways and stood at the door next to Mastina's guards, who they dwarfed. Both held their bolters across their chests. Intimidating did not come close. The last two strode into the room. The leader did not miss a beat as he snapped his attention to the physician walking towards Mastina. He wore no helm, his long blonde hair cascading down his shoulders. He was in his armor, huge sword at his thigh. Halt! What are you doing, butcher? commanded the chapter master of the blood spears. The physician turned to a statue and swung around to answer him, the marine towering over him, forcing the man to crane up just to see him. He has awoken. We failed. He will... He will need this to ease his way, said the man indicating the syringe. Take another step towards General Mastina and you die, the chapter master said, then bared his teeth at the poor man, and the poor fellow jumped back. The marine in white then looked down at the other group. He had shorter hair, but still blonde. His white armor marked him as an apothecary, a healer of the Astartes. He barked at the physicians, all of them. You are relieved of duty. Stand down and exit this facility. Immediately. He then looked to the red-armored warriors at the door. Brothers, clear the room. The marines now looked down on the militarum guards. It was tense, but they too followed out the gaggle of medics. The apothecary then looked at the readings, his eyes barely blinking as he absorbed the situation. The chapter master walked to the bedside of the general and knelt on one knee. No chair present could hold his weight, his primaris size. He bent over, taking the general's hand. It was thin, its skin like parchment draped over twigs. The rejuve had gone badly. My friend, you have seen better days, the marine stated. Mastina responded, I have. It was always unlikely, he said, shrugging. The chapter master looked past the general and saw the apothecary shaking his head slowly. The chapter master also nodded slowly and said, Did you bring it as instructed to the apothecary? Mastina could not help himself. He slowly turned his head to look for the response. The apothecary nodded and brought out an item of his own, a small metal thing, another syringe. Chapter Master Damari and Damon placed the general's hand back on the bed, then slowly took off his own metal gauntlet. He then took out an ornate knife. Its edge was keen. It shone like it was made of silver. Damarian then took up the hand of his friend again. He leant in close, almost whispering, There is an old custom to our people, to humans. I had never heard of it until recently. It is where two warriors can state to the very universe that they are of one mind, one soul. If this is the end, Mastina, then I would make this pact with you. I would be your blood brother. At this, the guards just bumped their bolters on their chests. The apothecary made the sign of the aquila 
as he tapped also. And so he continued. Yet we call ourselves the blood, for we are the children of Sanguinius, and it is through the blood his power resides. The apothecary came to the side of the general and took his left arm, found a vein, then plunged in. Mastina had no notion of what was in it, but he suddenly felt so tired. Now we do this. The huge marine grasped the knife and then broke the skin of Mastina's right hand in a long line. When he drew it across his own hand, he cut down to the bone. So fast was the marine recovery that he needed to delve this deep. And enhanced blood came forth. The marine then clasped his bleeding hand into the generals, holding them together with his left hand as he looked deep into Mastina's eyes. The other marines then left the room. Mastina watched them go and raised an eyebrow at his friend. Just in case things work, just in case they do not. Either way, we will want privacy, brother. Mastina shook his head as the confusion hit him. His eyes swam, his breathing became deeper, filling his lungs entirely. It felt like lava was coursing down his veins from his hand into his body. I will try to shield you against the worst of it, brother, said the marine. But he now seemed so distant to the old man. Mastino was exhausted. His eyes fluttered closed. Everything tasted of iron. All he could hear was wings. Distant beating wings getting closer. Two long days passed. None were given access to the ward. None knew what was happening within. Rumours began to filter out that someone had been passing the ward and heard screaming and the clash of sword on armour. Some said that the marine was guiding the general to the side of the emperor personally and that the doors would open with the blood spear alone in that room. On the morn of the third day, the doors finally opened and out strode two warriors of the Imperium, the Blood Angel and a much rejuvenated and energized general. He was not younger in his face, not really, but his body was filled out again, his stride long and confident, his back straight, and his eyes sparkled. In fact, the only true difference to a decade or two ago would be that he never ate in front of his staff ever again. And when he laughed, he held his hand over his mouth. General Mastino was back with a fire in his belly, and the sector collectively breathed a sigh of relief. When he was considered totally fit to return to active duty, which was less than a week, so Mastina did. And it was then the meeting was requested, a formal affair, worded in the most solemn way. The call had come from the Bloodspears chapter to gather here, and none refused their invitation. When Mastina's heavy steeled toe boots rang on the decks, the entire command staff were at attention as he walked inside the command room. He was then roundly applauded. Mastina waved and nodded slowly in appreciation. Then, after a moment or two, a slicing action from his hand, and the room silenced. Posts, he barked and his aide-de-camp was beaming at him, holding out a data tablet. Mastina took it and scanned its contents while stood before his main command throne. So many requisition requests, so many new arrivals. Many ships had gathered, Mastina had thought, in quite a morbid but also embarrassed way, for most knew this rejuve was dicey at best. They came to pass on their respects, he thought but then to make sure that they had a seat at the table to gain the right candidate to lead the sector forces. He saw the Mora's crows awaiting to pick his sector apart. But he was wrong. The Navy turned out in greater numbers than he thought possible unless they had stripped every ship of the line from patrol and piracy duties. More even. Mustina's eyebrows were already furrowed at the logistical nightmare ahead but it went on. 
The Adepta Sororitas and the Mechanicus had significant presences. Mastina's eyes near bulged out of his head as he read a word in High Gothic he had not seen in a century. For a contingent of ships contained a force rarely seen in this theatre, never before in his lifetime. Knights. From the look of things, the better part of an entire house. The shock now dulled, but the confusion increased, as Mastina noted the contents of many naval ships. Hundreds of regiments of guard from outside the sector. Large proportions of them were assault, mechanized, and even heavy tank formations. But the last one, the last requisitions, just deepened the situation. Substantial elements of two different chapters of Space Marines. They were not blood spears. And yet, they were here. Mastina immediately went to work, trying to fulfill every single last request in the most pertinent and logical way. And at the end of his shift, he went to the spot to find answers. There, in a deeply secluded side away of the station, looking out the window into the nebula, stood his friend. Mastina walked to his side and basked in the beauty of the galaxy with him. For over an hour, they just looked. Until finally, Mastina drew in breath to speak and found something being poked into his chest. It was a data slate held by the blood spear. This, this will explain everything, said the Marine, smiling to himself. General Mastina could see that Chapter Master Darman was not looking into the nebula, but watching for the General's reaction by looking at his reflection in the glass of the window. Mastina flipped on the slate and near dropped it. An icon blazed in front of him, rarely seen, never before this last millennium. The High Lords of Terror, of course, but with an icon above it. The sigil of the Lord Commander. He swept along and darted around the text. He read it and reread it, scrolling up and down in confusion. Then, finally, he stopped and looked up at his brother in arms. You knew this? Of course I knew, said the angel. Why didn't you tell me? I felt it would weigh too heavily on your deliberations about your future. That was kind of you, brother. Perhaps. The angel then fully and formally turned to the general and held out his hand, the one he had cut to merge their blood. So, will you accept the joint command with me? Mastina then clasped the proffered hand. Battle group Nimrod, eh? Why not? A surprise to be sure. Oh, not that much of a surprise. I took a leaf out of your book. By his own request, I have been sending the Lord Commander reports of your exploits, of the campaigns of reclamation, and he believes you deserve the chance to see how far we can get. And with that, Indomitus Battle Group Nimrod was formally begun under the command of General Mastina and Chapter Master Damarian Darman of the Blood Spears. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.